Hello and welcome to our fourth and final podcast on sex and genetics. In this video podcast, we're going to talk more specifically about sex limited and sex influence traits, X inactivation, and genomic imprinting. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let's talk about sex limited and sex influenced traits. As you're learning these terms, sometimes it's easy to get them switched around in your head because they sound similar. But let's first talk about sex limited traits. These are traits that affect a structure or function in only one sex. So only in males or females. The word only and limited, I guess you could think about it as being similar. These are traits that are limited to one sex. So any trait you could think of that is only found in males or females would be a sex limited trait. So we think about sex limited traits in females. You could think of things like lactation, producing milk to feed their children. That is only in females. Things like preeclampsia. This is a condition that some pregnant women will develop that results in high blood pressure. And this can be dangerous for both the mother and the child. And as preeclampsia worsens, often the mother is placed on bed rest, sometimes for the rest of the entire pregnancy. In both of these cases, only women have it, but men also could have the mutation for it. Let's use preeclampsia as an example. While we don't understand everything about preeclampsia, we know there are some recessive mutations on autosomes that can have an effect. And so individuals, and we'll just use little a, little a, have preeclampsia. And big A, little a, or big A, big A, don't have preeclampsia. The only way a woman could be little a, little a, she has to get one of those little a's from her father. So if we think of this person's parents, we know they at least have to be this, at least. At least one little a from each parent has to be donated to make this child here. Now, if this is dad, and this is mom, let's say, and let's go ahead and finish the pedigree here. In this example here, we say this child here would be unaffected. These two would be unaffected, but they would be carriers. And this child, when she grew up and had children, she would be at a greater risk of developing preeclampsia. So while men don't have the trait of preeclampsia, they can certainly have the mutation and it can be passed on to their daughters. If little a, little a happened to be one of their sons, again, that son would be unaffected, but he would pass it on to any of his daughters. Let's go ahead and mention some male sex limited traits. The classic example for a male sex limited trait would be beard growth. You could also think of deeper voices. Now, a lot of sex limited traits in both women and men, but we're talking about men here, are hormone influenced. So you wouldn't notice the beard growth or the deeper voice until after puberty when elevated levels of hormone begin to accumulate. Just like we talked about with the female sex limited traits, when we consider male sex limited traits, we also need to recognize that even though women don't have these traits, they can be carriers of those mutations and can pass those on to their sons. I guess what we might want to talk about are exceptions. Some of these limit sex limited traits you could imagine appearing in the other sex. For instance, you might see a woman who has a beard or a deeper voice. So that would be a kind of an exception. However, you're never going to see a man who has preeclampsia because he's never going to be pregnant. He can pass it on to his daughters. Next, I'd like to talk about sex influence traits. These are traits that are recessive in one sex, but dominant in the other sex. A classic example of a sex influenced trait would be male pattern baldness. And for simplicity, let's just go with our favorite allele here of big A. Okay, so big A codes for hair growth. It's kind of oversimplifying it, but we'll go with it for now. And so you can imagine that someone could be big A, big A. They could be big A, little A, or they could be little A, little A. And an individual sex could be female, 
or male. Someone who is big A, big A as either a female or male, I'm just going to put hair. They don't have male pattern baldness. They have a full head of hair. I've heard of people like that. And then males and females both in the homozygous recessive little a, little a would be bald. The key difference comes with the heterozygote. As the definition here says, it's recessive in one sex and dominant in the other. In females, this trait of male pattern baldness is recessive. You have to be little a, little a to be bald. Since it's recessive in females, she will have hair. Now in males, it's dominant. And so if this mutation is dominant, all it takes is one of those alleles to exert its effect. So these individual males who are big A, little a, heterozygous, will be bald. Now typically, even in these cases here, the woman who exhibits male pattern baldness won't be completely bald. There will be some wisps of hair, whereas the man tends to be uh, fairly bald. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is X inactivation. Okay, let's talk about this really interesting thing that happens in mammals, and it's called X inactivation. As we begin this discussion, let's think about XY males and XX females. We know that this X chromosome contains many essential genes that perform functions that we need for our survival. So a question that came up early on is this. Do males have half the amount of X chromosome proteins compared to females? We know that the X chromosome will produce a certain number of proteins relative to the number of genes it has. Since males have one X chromosome and females have two X chromosomes, does that mean she's going to produce twice as many X chromosome proteins? Or another way to say it, is he going to produce half the amount of X chromosome protein? It seems like at first thought that would be the case because two versus one. But what they discovered was this. First of all, this is not true. What is true is that males and females produce about the same amount of X chromosome proteins. So somehow men and women both produce proteins from their X chromosomes of roughly equivalent amounts. How is that possible? Well, let's talk about that. What we know is that there are many ways to achieve this, and we know that different animals use different strategies. However, I'm just going to talk about the strategy that mammals, which of course is the strategy that humans use, and it is, as the title says, X inactivation. Males, as they develop with one X chromosome, they will produce two cells, then four cells, and then ultimately a fully formed person here. And we know that in every one of their cells, besides their sperm, they have an X and a Y chromosome. Nothing changes for them. What happens in females is that at first, I'm going to draw this a little bit bigger here so I can include some information here. They have these two X chromosomes. And still, early in embryonic development, each cell is going to have two X chromosomes. At some point early in development, what happens is this. And I'm going to draw this picture down here, but I'm going to draw it bigger. And I'm going to draw the two X chromosomes in each of these. So these are X chromosomes. And just because I'm drawing only these two, you should realize that there's two of every other chromosome as well. There's two chromosomes one, two chromosomes two, and so forth. What happens is randomly one of these X chromosomes is selected. And so what happens is one of these X chromosomes is randomly inactivated. And it's not the same one for each of them. So for this one here, I'm going to show what this begins to look like. It gets pushed together and becomes inactive. And in this inactive form, we call it a bar body. You should know that, that, that word, I would think. Now, as I said, it's random. So in this cell, the X chromosome on the right became the bar body. Maybe in this cell, the one on the left became the bar body. And same thing here, it's completely random, like so. And then, as she continues to develop, what happens is this. All of her cells will have I'll just draw them like this, only one X chromosome expressing proteins because the bar body doesn't express proteins. It's kind of been strangled where nothing can come out of it anymore. It's still present and I can draw a little dot in here just to kind of signify that. And again, I guess I should draw up here. 
all of his cells are just going to have one X chromosome. I have one little tiny Y too. But in this way, males and females from each of their cells only express one X chromosome. Now this solves that problem, but it presents a new problem that I want to talk about. Sometimes this can affect the phenotype, not of the male, but of the female. And we see this with many human conditions, but for this example, I want to talk about the calico cat. And so we're going to erase some of this here. Now we know that there is a gene on the X chromosome that is linked to the color of a cat. And as the cat develops, it will eventually produce a solid color cat. Now what happens in females is if both of them are mutated, you would end up with a solid colored cat. However, if only one of them is mutated, you end up with what is known as a calico cat, a cat that is white with orange and black pigmentations in a, in a variety of different patterns. So how is that phenotype caused by an X minus X plus here? Well, remember, if we use this example down here, and this X chromosome has a mutation on it, and this one doesn't, this one has the mutation on it, this one doesn't, this one has the mutation on it, this doesn't, this has the mutation, this doesn't. So you can see, just looking at these four cells here, this cell is gonna produce the mutant pigment, this cell won't. This cell will produce the mutant pigment. This cell won't. As a result, you end up with a cat that is calico, a mixture of white, orange, and black. Because each one of their hair follicles will be different. One of them will be mutated, one of them won't. Because remember, the bar body, even though that unmutated gene is here, it's not expressed. This bar body contains the mutation, but it's not expressed. Okay, one more thing I'm going to talk about the bar bodies, but I'm going to erase this first. And that is making predictions on how many bar bodies an individual will have. So we can start off with XX, XY, and we'll put number of bar bodies. XX individuals will have one bar body. One of these X chromosomes in all of their cells will become a bar body. XY males here will have no bar bodies. We haven't talked about them yet, but there are some individuals that have different numbers of X and Y chromosomes. So let me just write some of these down and we'll talk more detail about these later. You could have somebody with three X chromosomes, two X chromosomes and one Y, one X and two Y chromosomes. If you want, you can hit pause and try to predict how many bar bodies will be in each of these three individuals and then turn the podcast back on and see if your answer is correct. All right, so let's reveal the answers then. Someone with three X chromosomes, they have two bar bodies. And let's talk about why that has to be so. Remember, the goal is that every individual expresses one X chromosome. And in order for somebody who has three X chromosomes to only express one X chromosome, two of them have to be turned into bar bodies, any two of them. And again, just like we saw in our explanation on the last whiteboard, it's random. It could be any two, but there's always going to be only one expressed. Okay, so XXY individual, they're going to have one. Again, because of that, because of that requirement that only one X chromosome is expressed. Now an XYY individual, they will have zero because they only have one X chromosome. Now, under most circumstances, as we talked about, these individuals, XX are female and XY individuals are male. You can also try to make a prediction on what sex these will be based upon our previous discussions. Someone who is XXX, there's no Y chromosome, so they will be female. And then both of these individuals, since they have the Y chromosome, they will have the SRY gene. And as a result, they will be male. So anytime there's a Y chromosome, they'll be male. If there are four X chromosomes and one Y chromosome, still male. On a test, if you see this, you can, and it's worded this way, you can always assume that the SRY gene is not mutated. If I want you to consider that the SRY gene is mutated, I will specifically tell you something like XXY, where the Y chromosome has a mutation on the SRY gene. But if I don't indicate it, you can assume there is no mutation there. All right, let's move on to our next topic. What I'd like to talk about on this whiteboard is something called genomic imprinting. It's a type of epigenetics. And we are only going to scratch the surface of genomic imprinting and epigenetics. We'll talk a little bit more about epigenetics later on. So let's begin with a definition. Genomic imprinting is an epigenetic 
phenomenon that causes gene expression to vary depending on the parent of origin. Up to this point, it didn't matter which parent provided the mutation, but with genomic imprinting it does. So let's consider this trait of albinism. Now this is not a genomically imprinted trait. It's a regular trait that we've, where it doesn't matter who the parent is. So in this case here, all the children would have big A, little a, and this being a recessive trait, they would all be fully pigmented. Let's consider albinism. Albinism is not a genom genomically imprinted trait. It's a trait based upon the rules we've already talked about. And those rules would have said if an individual, big A, big A, little a, little a, had children, they would all be big A, little a, and thus they would be fully pigmented. They would not have albinism because it's a recessive trait. And as long as you have that big A, you're fine. And it doesn't matter if the first this individual, big A, big A, is female, and little a, little a is male, or if the mom here was little a, little a, and the dad was big A, big A. You would still produce all big A, little a, and they would all be fully pigmented. What we're saying with genomic imprinting is that for some traits, it does matter whether the, the father or the mother pass on the mutation. So let's talk a little bit more about this. As an example, we're gonna talk about a trait that is important in fetal and placental growth. I'll just hide that up here in the corner so it doesn't get in our way. And we're gonna say, big A, you get wild type growth. Average size fetus and average size placenta. And little a, small and sometimes dangerously small growth. So let's consider a sperm here and an egg. The egg here, has the mutation, little a, in its genome, and the sperm does not. It has the big A, it's not mutated in the sperm's genome. We know that if these two come together and you make the heterozygote, big A, little a, the baby will develop and they will be of average size, as well as the placenta. Again, remember, this example was using the egg here, so coming from the f female, and the big A came from the sperm, from the dad. Th this is pretty much what you would predict following the laws of Mendel. So now let's consider the opposite, that dad provides the little a, the mutated allele, and mom provides the unmutated allele. They are still heterozygous, but the baby that results is small with small and underdeveloped placenta. Two heterozygotes. The only difference is in this one, the mutation was provided by dad. The other one, which isn't here anymore, the mutation was provided by mom. So what's happening here? Well, what I'd like to do is make this zygote here bigger. So I'm gonna draw more things in there. It turns out that the A gene provided from the sperm will look something like this. And it is expressed. That's just my symbol showing that it's expressed. It's going to make ultimately the mutant protein A, which is the one that's gonna cause the problem. Now, the gene that came from mom, big A, it should protect against this little A because it's a recessive trait. However, what happens is it is not turned on. In fact, this gene, whether it's big A, little A, is never expressed when it comes from the A. And the little A, it could be little A or big A, it doesn't matter. If it comes from dad, it's always expressed. So let me state this again briefly. Some genes from dad, like this gene for fetal growth, are expressed. And these same genes, when they come from mom, are not expressed. So even though genotypically they are heterozygous, phenotypically only the little a is being expressed. And so that's why you get this result. In fact, if mom also provided a little a, it wouldn't change the phenotype. It's the same phenotype. It doesn't matter what mom's providing here because it's shut off. All that matters is what dad's providing. There are other genes that are, are flipped where mom's genes are turned on and dad's aren't. Now, I want you to remember though that, that this is rare. Most genes are not genomically imprinted in this way. Only a few of the genes are this way. Most genes are fully expressed regardless if they come from mom or dad. Now, I wanna talk about one other quick example because it's something 
that if you're going into the health profession, you may, you may come across. So what I want to talk about in this example are two different diseases. One is called Prader-Willi syndrome, and the other is called Angelman syndrome. They both involve chromosome 15. And I'll just draw it like this. This region here, roughly, there are several genes. And what I'm about to describe here is a lot more complicated, but this is what I would want you to know. There are several genes here that are, that are important for neurophysiology and neural development. People with Prader-Willi are typically smaller at birth, but early in their life, say by age three, they develop this uncontrolled obsession with eating that is accompanied with a slower metabolism. So as a result, they're eating a lot more but they're not metabolizing it. So they tend to gain a lot of weight. Parents who have children with prader willi often are advised to put locks on doors, lock the refrigerator, because the obsession is so strong. Because if they don't lock everything up and really control what their child eats, they can literally eat themselves to death by their digestive organs bursting. Now, Angelman syndrome has a, a very different phenotype. These individuals will have lots of symptoms. They include frequently autism. They have other intellectual disabilities, extended tongue. They also ha tend to have poor coordination of their muscles. And they all tend to kind of flap their arms a lot because they have these muscle reflexes, uh, convulsions they have. These two syndromes are linked because they're controlled by this same region. And this is where the genomic imprinting comes into play. Some of these genes are not expressed from mom's side, and some of these genes are not expressed from dad's. You get Prader-Willi when the dad's sperm provides a chromosome 15 that has a deletion in this area, this area here. As a result, it's missing these genes. Now, I drew it here with this gap here, but in reality, these two ends are actually connected. I'm just wanting to signify that these genes are gone. In the copy donated by dad. The egg, on the other hand, provides a chromosome 15 without the deletion. The resulting egg will have dad's chromosome here. And in this case, I'm just going to draw it shorter because that's really what happens. It's just a little shorter because it's missing this region here. And then mom's copy here will not have that deletion, so it'll be a little longer. Missing these genes from dad leads to Prader-Willi. Now, Angelman syndrome is a little different. Here, dad provides a copy of chromosome 15 with no mutation. Mom, however, she provides a copy of chromosome 15 that has that deletion in it. This results in an embryo that has dad's chromosome 15 with no mutation in it and mom's chromosome 15 that has the deletion in it. So I'm just going to draw it a little smaller because these ends, of course, are pulled together. So the only difference between Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome at the genetic level is which parent con contributes chromosome 15 that is deleted. And that's all I really want you to know about Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome. Well, this brings us to the end of our podcast on genetics and sex. If you have any questions at all, though, please make sure you contact me. If not, I'll see you on the next podcast. Bye for now.